Welcome to Swimming with Alligators. I'm Ernest Sweat, and each episode, Alexa Benz and I give you a VC podcast from the LP perspective. You ready? Let's dive in. Today on Swimming with Alligators, we are thrilled to have Renata Arauz de Stefano, an investor at Pivotal Ventures. We learned about lessons from her early career in micro lending, Pivotal's unique approach to identifying top quartile managers, and a handful of blue ocean opportunities where more LPs and GPs should be putting money to work. Today on Swimming with Allocators, we have the pleasure of speaking with Renata Aroz de Stefano, an investor at Pivotal Ventures. Pivotal Ventures is an investment and incubation company created by Melinda French Gates. French Gates has made a breakthrough commitment of $1 billion to expand women's power and influence through philanthropic grants, private investments, partnerships, and advocacy. Renata sits on the investment team at Pivotal, where they back both startups and fund managers that have products and strategies respectfully that improve the lives of women and all they care for. So with that, we're excited to bring on Renata today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me and thanks for the beautiful introduction. So I wanted to start, we always like to start off kind of like with the person and, and um, you have such a uh, global and colorful career path to venture. Can you tell us how you got into this position? Sure. I appreciate that description as well. I <laughs> usually just say it's non-traditional. <laughs> um, I think this path started back when I was a kid. I grew up in Philadelphia, but spending my summers in Ecuador, where my family is from, and saw a ton of inequities in Philadelphia, but really it was more visceral to me when it was in my own family. Um, mm. So going back and forth, seeing the opportunities that I had versus what my cousins were facing, um, just merely because I was born in Philadelphia. Um, so that got me thinking about like, why is it this way? Why do we have different opportunities? Why do we have access to different things, especially when it comes to money? Um, so I remember in high school, my senior project, I ran a fundraiser for the school in the village my dad is from in Ecuador. Um, because as a teenager, you're like, how do I get money? Like fundraiser, you sell brownies or whatever. Um, so that started me on this path, um, really asking myself constantly, like, who's making these decisions? How is capital allocated? And why are people deciding to allocate it in this way? So I uh, went to school, was really interested in the Latin American region, just given my upbringing, um, started my career in microfinance, so mm. supporting small business owners. Uh, again, they're excluded from the traditional financial system, so how do we get that capital into their hands? Um, that took me back to business school to make the pivot into venture capital. Ultimately, I was in Nairobi for a couple years investing in climate tech. And then here at Pivotal, you know, we are using capital to advance social progress. We pull on different levers across policy, for philanthropy, and venture. And my team in particular, as you said, um, works to really expand the number of check writers, women check writers in the U.S. Um, we all know the stats, you know, 16% of decision makers in VC are women. So for us, it's really about moving the needle um, by backing women-led funds. And I feel a lot of alignment just personally, to be at an organization that's using capital to challenge the status quo and over the long term, hopefully change the face of venture capital here. That's awesome. And and you just touched on a lot of different things. You've, you've definitely uh, been involved in certain themes, especially when you think about um, impact within the lens of, of venture, uh, going from microfinance to climate uh, abroad. Uh, from those two experiences, are there any like anecdotes or experiences that really shaped uh, your your now role in helping you become a better, you know, both venture investor and and you know help with like finding great fund invest and fund managers as well? Definitely, I'd point to two things um, in microfinance. I was out literally in the field in the markets doing a lot of market research, talking to our end user and. We really believed in a process that was co-designing solutions to these entrepreneurs. Um, mm. They were folks who didn't have credit scores. They oftentimes didn't even have a bank account, right? So we had to listen. We had to have empathy. And I think those are things, I mean, VC, you know, they talk about product market fit. I think a lot of that translates. And even as an LP, you want a GP who understands their end user, who understands the founder, has empathy for the founder. So I think some of these soft skills really translate 
Um, and in terms of my experience in Kenya and Nairobi, um, I think the importance of having um, diverse founders at the table, the mm. importance of having a diverse pipeline sourcing in places that are beyond, you know, um, certain schools or certain countries. Uh, I was really surprised being in the Nairobi ecosystem, just the number of founders that were getting back that were maybe from Europe or from the US and um, in turn, a lot of um, local founders would be overlooked. Um, and I think we see the same trends here in the US, uh, different communities, uh, women founders, black, Latino founders being overlooked. Um, but I think it's pushed me to be more proactive and more critical about like how we're sourcing at the top line, um, for, uh, top of funnel. No, but I really appreciate hearing, you know, how both the industry has been growing and sort of becoming more um, uh, effective at using uh, investing for change. Um, and also, it sounds like you potentially had some exam examples where you've changed your mind about where your thinking has changed. Can you share any of those examples of maybe something that you initially thought and then through these various organizations, you've you've come to have a different approach? I think I've bounced around in, like the change I've been hoping to affect has been the same. Um, it's about access to capital, it's about equity. Um, and I know that there's various tools, right? Um, going back to my college days, I could have maybe gone the pre-med route and been a doctor. And like, there's all, all sorts of ways of when you're thinking about what does equity look like? Um, so I think for me, it's having that flexibility um, and that curiosity. Uh, microfinance is one channel, and the organization I was with, Finca, is still running. It's based here in D.C. Um, I get coffee occasionally with the president. Uh, <laughs> so I think as a younger person, I was very much you know, solution-oriented. There has to be one right answer. And I think mm. as I've grown, as I've sat on different sides, I even did a stint in investment banking and really thinking at a high level, like the ways we can use capital to affect change and there not being a right or wrong. Um, here at Pivotal, we talk about having different tools in our toolkit. We work on policy, we work on philanthropy, um, and also on venture. So I think it's really about looking holistically at the solutions needed to advance social progress and then kind of looking at our toolkit and say, okay, what's appropriate for this opportunity? Um, so I think that flexible mindset is something that I've learned over the years. No, I'd love to hear more about that toolkit compared to your standard allocators, um, how your approach is a little different. Of course. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a team that works on the philanthropic side as well as policy. And across all three um, kind of verticals at Pivotal, our North Star is expanding women's power and influence, that $1 billion commitment that Ernest mentioned in the beginning. Um, on the VC side, the way we interpret that or the way we act on it is by allocating capital to women-led and co-led funds. Um, because for us in venture capital, for women to have a seat at the table, to have power and to exert influence, they need to be the check writers. Um, so we are engaging as an institutional LP. To your question about maybe how we think a little differently about the tools in our toolkit, um, we are still seeking market rate returns, and I think that's a key aspect of our strategy. There is this persistent misconception that by backing women-led funds or funds led by a black or Latino GP that that's concessionary in some way or that it's an impact fund. Mm. Um, but we really want to demonstrate through returns that our portfolio will outperform and that diversity wins. Um, and I think in terms of the diligence process and how that shows that maybe more concretely um, is that we take a very holistic approach. Um, we don't have a minimum number of years of VC experience. We don't require X number of angel investments in terms of a track record. Um, for us, lived experiences are really important. Mm -hmm. uh, your networks, having access to a diversified pipeline and like really unique sourcing strategies, all that really um, is something that we evaluate at the same level as we would a traditional track record. Um, we don't believe that there's a right way to be a VC. I mean, just look at my background. <laughs> um, and there's no blueprint. And we aren't going to ding someone for not having sat at you know, a top tier VC firm for the last 10 years. 
Uh, there's I, I want to just hold your kind of like train that you're headed to on the because I, I have some questions around your selection criteria and where you see opportunity. But at first, I, I wanted to kind of double click on Pivotal and, I, you know, in the research seeing that it was established in 2015. That's a very interesting point of like all the things that were going on within the market to now today. What's the case for an organization like Pivotal still today? Um, and why do you believe it's critical given all of the different macro trends happen in the asset class and the potential for more uh, contraction? I may be biased, <laughs> seeing as how I'm sitting at Pivotal today, but I think our work is more important now than ever. Um, the stats for women-led companies getting funded, the stats for black women founders, Latina women founders, they're not budging. Um, so I think this thesis is remains relevant, remains important. Um, and in this macro environment where a lot of LPs are pulling back, um, where fund, fundraising timelines for VC funds, especially emerging managers, are taking longer, where folks, even on fund two, three, are having tr trouble getting to their target AUM, um, the fact that we're able to still be active in the market, I think is a game changer for the, the funds we're able to commit to. Makes total sense. Now we're gonna take a quick break to speak with our sponsor. On the show today, we have an industry expert and sponsor, Rachel Waddell, Vice President of Investor Coverage at Silicon Valley Bank, a division of First Citizens Bank. Thank you, Rachel, for partnering with us on the show and being on the show today. Yeah. Hi, Ernest. So excited to be here and appreciate you having me. I'm excited to kind of dig into some of the market data and, and venture trends that our analytics team produced this year. Absolutely. I want to jump right into it. So as you mentioned, SVB publishes uh, reports, and one is a biannual report on the state of the markets um, for it, the innovation economy as a whole. Um, my question to start off is, have we hit the bottom of this cycle yet? Yeah, so it, I mean, it does appear that we're reaching a floor. Um, US VC investment has been relatively stable since July of this year, um, holding at about $180 billion, trailing 12 months. Um, what you know is a significant drop from the $450 billion in US VC investment in 2022, but we are still above 2018 levels and historic norms. Um, and then it's also important to note that uh, we're sitting on a record amount of dry powder that's waiting to be deployed with over $280 billion in undeployed US VC funds. So that can really fuel the next VC boom. Um, and we'll likely see an uptick in uh, deal activity in the later half of 2024 as companies run out of runway um, and potentially public markets open back up. Well, I can't can't wait into that time. We've been kind of <laughs> kicking <laughs> kicking it down the can that optimism, but I feel like it's coming soon. Um, and and so your research breaks down how GPs, general partners are using um, net asset value uh, loans far more. Would love to hear about that and what it could signal for LP distributions. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, NAV loans are alternative liquidity solutions, primarily used by private equity and growth equity funds when they need additional capital to invest in their portfolio, whether that be a follow-on investment, a new deal, or to help finance an acquisition. Um, and they've really grown in popularity the past couple of years. Um, and what we're seeing uh, with the muted exit environment is that GPs are really experiencing kind of more paper gains and actual returns to their fund and distributions to their LPs. And LPs are really in need of these distributions to manage their own cash flow um, and operating budgets. And so we're actually kind of seeing a shift in the purpose of NAV loans and likely see an uptick in them um, where Prior or historically, they've been used more for um, portfolio enhancement and IRR enhancement. Um, but we may see a shift in that they're used more for LP distributions and liquidity mm. management. Rachel, you're such a good partner here in the venture ecosystem. For folks who are interested in getting in touch with Rachel and SVB, feel free to email her at rwaddle, W-A-D-D-E-L-L, -L, at svb.com. And now back to our LP interview. Now, so with all that, 
Um, a lot of people are still, you know, committed in in raising new funds. Um, just curious what you all are seeing in the market. Um, are you seeing any strategies being overused? Uh, you know, I, I won't use the two letters that are being used in every VC pitch deck today. Um, or are you seeing any interesting blue uh, ocean approaches? Sure. So to the two letter word <laughs> that you're referring to, I think for us, we have an AI fund in our portfolio, but we committed years ago, right? So if this is something that you've been doing, if you're an engineer, if you're a PhD, if you have that background, we're all for it. Um, where we hesitate is where it's a fund that you know was a generalist six months ago, and now they're adding AI into their deck. Um, so I think just being thoughtful about that, um, it goes back to something that's really important for us in the diligence process, which is you know as there's founder market fit, we also want GP market fit. So if you have the experiences and the profile to have an advantage in a certain sector, um, we think that's great and a huge value add. Um, in terms of things that we're seeing or approaches that we really appreciate, um, we do have a large concentration in the Bay and New York, of course, but we are really excited about folks that are approaching sourcing differently, especially from a geographic perspective. A fund we committed to, I was just with them yesterday in San Francisco, Beta Boom, Kimi Palouche. So their tagline is everywhere but the Bay. <laughs> so um, they're based in Salt Lake City, they're a pre seed and seed fund, and they're really capitalizing on these overlooked founders who just aren't getting the same access to GPs and to funding as folks who are in the Bay Area, for example. Um, so I think that's a great example of something that we get excited about. Um, into our earlier conversation about this gap for women founders, for black and Latino founders, um, especially at their early growth stage. So series A, B, there's this cliff that we all talk about and persist to this day. And that's a space that we're hoping to address. We've invested in one fund called Rethink Impact, which backs women-led founder, women-led companies, and they go up to series A and B. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, let me rephrase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so Rethink Impact invests from late C to Series C. So they're with women-led companies through that crucial juncture. And then another fund that we just committed to this year in their first close was Cherry Rock Capital. Yeah. And they are focused exclusively on the Series A and B for Black and Latin A founders. Um, so I think folks that are taking a step back, evaluating the market and seeing where's their gap, um, and of course have the team in place to be able to address that, I think those are really exciting opportunities. Mm, that's great advice that um, some of these emerging managers should be looking a little higher upstream. Uh, I certainly have experienced that first firsthand. I've worked for two amazing female GPs, and when you're investing at the pre-seed and seed stage, there's a lot of um, gals to share deals with. And, and the Rethink team is only one that can come to mind for me of, of who I would share those those later stage and, deals. And it's tough, right? Because the stage that you invested in is very much influenced by how much money you're able to raise. So as an emerging manager, as a woman manager, unfortunately, it's a bit harder to raise. It's a bit harder to raise a big fund. So we see that with women-led women -led funds, diverse-led funds, um, unfortunately kind of pigeonholed into earlier stage um, as a result of the fund size that they're able to raise. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do you have any advice for um, gals who are in the market raising right now on uh, strategies you've seen work to, to close that fund or um, to, to get that second close? Um, I would say it's tough across the board. Um, you all know probably the LP or VC fundraising is at, on track to be on a decade low this year. Um, so it's not just women-led funds. I think women-led funds bear the brunt of it. Um, so and emerging managers more generally because inherently as an emerging manager, you have less of a track record. Um, as far as advice, uh, we talk a lot about having a minimum viable fund size in mind. Um, I hate to say it, it goes against what I was saying about um, you know raising for later stage early growth funds, 
But um, I think given the market, GPs who are able to level set and understand that closing at a smaller amount, getting a track record will just make it easier to come to market in you know 18 months when hopefully the markets are picking up a bit. So um, for us, we'd rather you close at a smaller AUM and start investing than be investing or be fundraising for two years and then have less time to dedicate to the investing side. Um, so thinking about minimum viable fund size, um, if you do have investments, really important to focus on runway. That's what everyone's talking about now. Um, we want to see you uh, prioritizing the health of your companies, ha have a st strategy around how to support them. Um, and I think we are here to help. We take calls with <laughs> any woman led or co led fundraising in the US and even if it's not a fit for us currently because for example right now we've um, hit our allocation targets for the year but we're always making introductions we're sharing our diligence memos with co-investors we really want to support folks in getting over to the finish line makes total sense um, kind of a flip side of that question once you've already supported a manager what's your advice now when when the market they're looking to raise a fund two or fund three, or even I've heard dependent, especially if it's an earlier stage uh, strategy, even a fund four, what advice are you giving those managers um, or any managers that are out there? Sure, I would say we let our GPs take the lead. We're not saying you should raise X number of millions of dollars, um, but we are seeing GPs proactively respond in some of the ways that I've shared in lowering their target AUM in, you know, maybe they had aspired to change a few things in their fund model and their portfolio construction. But I think the name of the game today is keeping it as simple and as consistent as possible. Um, no bells and whistles, no new strategies <laughs> um, because of the shift in risk tolerance and appetite from LPs. So um, yeah, lower AUM targets, lots of consistency when it comes to fees, when it comes to sectors. Um, folks just wanna see, did you do what you said you would do? Are you gonna keep doing the same thing? Yeah. I would say now is not the time to have a lot of changes to your strategy. When, um Let's say I, I've, I'm a new manager and it, the time's not right, but we, we're staying in touch. Uh, can you give us like a glimpse from an LP perspective on what actual data points you're tracking and to stack rank against existing managers versus new managers when looking to make new allocation? Definitely. And I would say there are a few funds in our portfolio where we met them for a fund one and then committed to a fund two. So with us it truly is a wait and see um in terms of what we're tracking we always like to get on a distribution list so hopefully you're sending updates at least quarterly we want to see how your fundraise is progressing who's coming in as an lp uh pipeline if you don't have investments even a pipeline and it can be anonymous but we want to see what is exciting to you where they're based what the founders are like um so as much intel as you can share there i think is great um, as we mentioned <laughs> before uh, starting to record, we travel a lot and we're pretty open about that on places like LinkedIn. So if you see that we'll be in your city, reach out, let's grab coffee. Uh, hopefully you can make it to an event we're at. Um, keeping us up to date in that way is great. It's a little less informal, but more about building the relationship. And we review pipeline internally on a quarterly basis. So if you're able to update us in a similar cadence, I think that's great because then you'll stay top of mind, we'll have some updated data to review, and then we can um, take conversations as needed. Um, no, that's that's great to hear that you are, you expect a long-term relationship. So just, we're in November, it makes sense that you've already um, committed for the year, but that these relationships take time. A, a sort of open-ended question for you, is there anything that you see folks, whether that's other allocators or GPs or VC Twitter, that get wrong when it comes to venture today, where you have a more nuanced or counter opinion? 
I am now on VC Twitter, for better or worse. <laughs> that's that's for better. That's probably for that's better. for better. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do folks get wrong? I mean, immediately, just given our platform, I go back to this misconception about what it means to have impact, what it means to invest with an eye towards social progress. Um, given my background, you know, even in microfinance, it's a loan. There's a relatively high interest rate just because of the cost of getting that loan. You know, we have to go to rural communities, et cetera. Um, so I think a through line through my career has been yes, equity, yes, access, but also market driven solutions. So unfortunately, you know, I started in microfinance in 2012, like over a decade ago, and we're still at a place where I think that companies, whether it's a microfinance organization, whether it's a impact fund, there's still a portion of the VC sector that considers that to be catalytic investment, to be concessionary. Um, and again, I think that's what we're out to debunk with our portfolio. We have, you know, we wanted our funds all to be above median, hopefully a lot of first quartile funds. <laughs> um, so I think that's something that persists and that we're actively trying to disprove. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and we believe it. We believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Beyond what we've discussed, uh, any words of wisdom to share with our audience or um, this community includes allocators and investors? I think... The reality is it's a tough time for everyone involved. Um, what I keep going back to and what our team always pushes on is this idea of remaining curious and open-minded and really having this growth mindset. Um, we reevaluate our diligence process on a yearly basis at least. Um, we're always challenging our assumptions. What biases do we have? Um, we recently conducted a project with an organization called the Racial Equity Asset Lab to really evaluate our process from start to finish because while we do consider our process to be extremely accessible and equitable from a demographic perspective, we always know that we can be better. Um, so we wanted yeah. some fresh eyes on our diligence process. They even had reference calls with funds that we've passed on. Um, so I think that's just an example of how I think LPs in particular, just given the check sizes that we write, the influence we can have. Um, it's important for us to continue to challenge ourselves um, because at the end of the day, um, we need to be uh, evolving in the same way as the rest of the sector, as the GPs, as the founders. You know, we want founders who are curious and have a growth mindset. And I think as LPs, we can adopt that mindset as well. That's great. I don't think, I don't think we need to add anything else to that. Uh, that was an awesome point. Um, Renata, we just want to thank you for joining us on Swimming with Alligators. Thank um, you, Renata. We love Pivotal. We do. We love everything you do. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for this opportunity, and congrats on getting the podcast kicked off. See you later, Alligator. After Portfolio Tile, investing with a smile.